Hello and welcome to True Crime Case Files. This show deals with violent and often disturbing crimes committed against men, women and children. Some material may not be suitable for all audiences. Therefore, listener discretion is strongly advised. George Stinney Jr., a young African-American boy, was tragically convicted and executed at the age of 14 for the murders of two young girls in his hometown of Alkaloos, South Carolina. However, in 2014, his murder conviction was finally vacated after a re-examination of his case revealed that he had not received a fair trial. In 1944, George lived with his family in Alkaloo, a small mill town where racial segregation was prevalent. On March 23rd, the bodies of Betty June Binnaker and Mary Emma Thames were discovered in a ditch on the African-American side of town. The girls had been brutally beaten with a blunt object, causing severe trauma to their skulls. George's father assisted in the search for the girls, but soon both George and his older brother John were arrested on suspicion of the murders. While John was eventually released, George remained in custody and was not allowed to see his parents until after his trial. He was held in a jail 50 miles away from Alkaloo due to the fear of lynching. During his confinement and trial, George had no support and was questioned without the presence of his parents or an attorney. This violated his rights under the Sixth Amendment which guarantees legal counsel. However, at the time of his trial, this requirement was not consistently upheld. In 2014, after 70 years, a South Carolina court ruled that George had not received a fair trial and was wrongfully executed. This ruling finally brought justice to George's name and highlighted the injustices he faced as a young African-American boy in the 20th century. The case of George Stinney Jr. serves as a reminder of the importance of fair and just legal proceedings regardless of race or age. It is a tragic story that should never be forgotten as it sheds light on the systemic injustices that have plagued our history. The entire legal process against Stinney was swift and deeply flawed. His court-appointed counsel, Charles Plowden, failed to challenge the police officer's testimonies or the prosecution's presentation of two conflicting versions of Stinney's confession. The trial lasted only two and a half hours, during which Stinney's counsel did not call any witnesses or offer a substantial defense. The all-white jury deliberated for less than ten minutes before finding Stinney guilty of murder. Despite pleas for clemency from Stinney's family, churches, and even white women in South Carolina, Governor Olin D. Johnston allowed the execution to proceed. He claimed that Stinney had admitted to raping and killing the two girls, but these claims were not supported by the girls' autopsies. Stinney's parents were only allowed to see him once after the trial, and under the threat of lynching, they were not allowed any further visits. On June 16, 1944, Stinney was executed by electric chair. He was so small that a Bible was used as a booster seat, and he was restrained to the chair. When asked if he had any last words, Stinney shook his head and said, No, sir. As the execution took place, Tears streamed down his face, and the mask covering slipped off. In 2004, local historian George Fryson began researching the case and gained the support of lawyers and organizations, including the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. They worked tirelessly to uncover evidence and witnesses to exonerate Stinney. Their efforts eventually led to the vacating of Stinney's murder conviction in 2014, 70 years after his execution. Mackenzie, Burgess and attorney Ray Chandler, representing Stinney's family, filed a motion for a new trial in October 2013. They believed that there was no evidence to convict Stinney and that the case needed to be reopened to correct the injustice. They were optimistic that with the help of non-family witnesses, they could prove Stinney's innocence and be successful in court. Local historian George Fryson also uncovered new information suggesting an alternate suspect a member of a prominent white family who served on the initial coroner's inquest jury. Fryson believed that this person made a deathbed confession, implicating themselves in the crime. This information further supported the argument for Stinney's innocence. The Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project submitted an amicus brief, stating that there was compelling evidence of Stinney's innocence. They highlighted the lack of proper legal representation the reliance on an unrecorded and unsigned confession from a 14-year-old without counsel or parental guidance, and the failure to call witnesses that could have exonerated Stinney. In January 2014, new evidence was presented during a court hearing. Stinney's siblings testified that he was with them at the time of the murders, 
and an affidavit from Reverend Francis Batson suggested that the girls may have been killed elsewhere and moved to the ditch where they were found. Another inmate, Wilford Johnny Hunter, testified that Stinney had told him he was coerced into confessing and maintained his innocence. Despite these revelations, a new trial was not granted. However, on December 16, 2014, Circuit Court Judge Carmen Mullen vacated Stinney's conviction. She ruled that he had not received a fair trial, as his defence was ineffective and his Sixth Amendment rights were violated. Mullen also deemed the execution of a 14-year-old to be cruel and unusual punishment. While she acknowledged that Stinney may have committed the crime, she criticised the lack of proper legal procedures and support for a child facing such serious charges. The ruling was a rare use of the legal remedy of quorum nobis. It acknowledged the flaws in the original trial process and the violation of Stinney's rights. While Stinney's guilt or innocence was not definitively determined, the judgment recognised the injustice he faced and the need for a fair trial. The overturning of Stinney's conviction brought mixed reactions from the relatives of Betty Binnaker and Mary Thames. While Stinney's family and civil rights advocates celebrated the ruling, the relatives of the murdered girls expressed disappointment and maintained their belief in Stinney's guilt. They argued that extensive research conducted by the family supports their conviction that Stinney was the perpetrator. They claimed that a police officer who had arrested Stinney contacted them in the 1990s and affirmed Stinney's guilt. They also disputed the claims of a deathbed confession from another individual, stating that there was no substantiation for these allegations. The family members felt that the public opinion surrounding Stinney's case was one-sided and that Stinney had been wrongly portrayed as a poor, pitiful little black boy. They believed that people who only read newspaper articles did not know the full truth of the case. However, one niece of Betty Binnaker, while still convinced of Stinney's guilt, acknowledged that he did not receive a fair trial and should not have been given the death penalty. She expressed sympathy for Stinney and his family, hoping that they would eventually find peace. Another childhood acquaintance of Binnaker expressed regret over Stinney's execution, stating that they wished he had been sent to prison instead. The differing perspectives from the relatives of the victims highlight the complexity and emotional impact of the case. While Stinney's conviction was overturned due to the unfairness of his trial, the debate over his guilt or innocence continues to evoke strong opinions and conflicting viewpoints. Since Stinney's exoneration, there has been speculation surrounding George Washington Burke Jr., the son of a wealthy white businessman, as a possible suspect for the murders. Burke Jr. died a few years after the girls' murders, and there have been claims that he may have been involved. Stinney's mother had worked for the Burke family, and there were allegations of inappropriate advances made by Burke Sr. towards her. Stinney's sister believed that the Burke boys framed Stinney to divert attention from their own involvement. Burke Sr. was involved in the search for the girls and owned the area where their bodies were found. He was also the foreman of the grand jury that indicted Stinney, leading to accusations of bias. There have been accounts of Burke Jr. being known for womanizing and theft, with some suggesting that he got away with his crimes. Sonia Edie Williamson, a resident of Alkaloo investigating the case, claimed that Burke Jr.'s son had told her that his father had picked up the girls in his lumber truck on the day of the murders. However, Wayne Burke later denied making this statement and maintained his belief in Stinney's guilt. Lawyers for the Stinney family have mentioned rumours of a deathbed confession by a member of a prominent white family, but this has not been substantiated. George Stinney's case has become a prominent example in discussions about the death penalty in the United States particularly in arguments against its use. Many believe that Stinney was innocent and unjustly executed. In January 2022, a bill named after Stinney, the George Stinney Fund, was introduced in South Carolina. The bill proposes that the state pay $10 million to the families of wrongfully executed individuals if their convictions are posthumously overturned.